I mean really lost. Like in the deep dark lost. Like lost lost, right? Wow. Get y'all some compasses around here. Amen. Lost is defined by not being able to find one's way on their own, right? When we realize we are off our original destination, that's how lost is defined. We ask ourselves, where am I? Or maybe those who are expecting you ask, where are you? Where are you? Only to be able to respond honestly, I don't know. That's where I spend most of my days. It's like, I really don't know where I'm at today. I'm just, I'm reacting, right? Good morning. In last week's message, A Reach to Faith, I mentioned that God often questions us. I then shared with you some of the Bible examples of those questions, such as God asked Gideon, where are you hiding, right? Jonah, he were asked, where are you running to? Thomas, he asked, why do you doubt me? Peter, he asked, why do you deny me? And we all know how this all started with Adam, who he asked what? Where are you? You were just here in the garden with me, and then something happened, and now you're doing what? You're hiding in a fig leaf. That had to be uncomfortable. I'm just saying, you ever felt a fig leaf? Those are itchy. I would find that most uncomfortable, right? But that's what he had, and he asked those questions, which is the same series of questions that he often asks us today, and that serves a purpose. And, but however, when God asks us a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer, right? You do understand that. His question through the Holy Spirit is to us is to act as a checkpoint for our lives, a redirection as for many, a wake-up call, if you will, a redirect. It's that power of redemption, a question for the purpose of redemption with the intention in either uh, of a lost person to, or a saved person to call them back. Because sometimes the saved people, guess what happens to us? We have a tendency to do what? Come on now. Don't get quiet on me now. To wander off, right? To get lost, to step off a degree or two. And I think that's the title of today's sermon. One degree off. How many would claim to be one degree off? How many would claim to be more than one degree off? I'm pretty sure I'm a bunch of degrees off. And I don't know who Tony is, because every time I ask him this morning, Tony's like, yes, sir. And I'm like, he's always like he stole somebody's chickens. Right? It's the guilty complex kind. I'm trying to get him to relax. It's, it's just a quick, good morning, Tony. <laughs> I often wonder about the same example that they gave us of the prodigal son. When he, when he asked, where are you, son? <coughs> where are you, son? Why not turn around and come home to your father who has much to share with you? That's the reason that God asks us those questions. Where are you? The questions as encouragement and, and in convictions that are similar to the like signs along the highway, which remind us of what route we are on, right? What dangers lie ahead, how fast or slow we should be driving, when to yield and when to stop, and how far it is to our desired destination. I was thinking about that. You ever been going down the road thinking you're going to, say you're going to Longview, and you suddenly see the sign that says, Danger Field, 12 miles? You have to question what? Where am I? Right? I don't know if you've ever done that, but I used to, I mean, have you ever been in the habit to drive down and take a ride and go to work or go someplace, ever, like going to church? Like, you know, I, oh, I love to mess with your GPS, don't you? Because they think you're so smart. I just take different routes, sometimes long routes, just to irritate her, right? Huh? Because you get in the car and she goes, 18 miles to blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm going to go this way and make it 36 just to irritate because I don't want her to know where I'm at, right? I'm not talking about Barb. I'm talking about the computer, right? I'm just talking about the computer. But that's why those signs are there, right? So when you realize that you're going to Dangerfield and you want to go to Longview, what do you do? Turn around. You turn around, and what's that word called? In Repent. spiritual terms. Repent. Redemption. Repentance, right? Thus are the words of God to ask, are you headed in the right direction? As to ask, are you headed in God's direction? And I always loved that old song. I, kept, I didn't put it in my sermon, but it kept on headed right in the wrong direction. Ever been there? Mm -hmm. Headed right in the wrong direction? That, that's what he's asking the tough questions such as, why are you hiding as a Christian? Why do you doubt me as a Christian? Where are you as a Christian? Where's your voice? Have you forgotten the battle that you're in? Have you forgotten the purpose of why I saved you, why I cleansed you, why I raised you up? For he has every effort to bribe the needed redemption to guide us home to heaven. That's his only goal. That's, God, that's why he sent his son here. That's why he left the Holy Spirit here, because that Holy Spirit are those road signs of conviction along the way, those road signs of acknowledgement, Corey, that say, hey, is that really the right direction? Are you on the way to Longview or Dangerfield this morning? Well, I don't know. I was just going to go to lunch, but I could go either place, right? That's that middle of the world road where he said, don't get caught there, right? Don't get caught in North City and not know which direction to turn, right? Pick one. Pick one. But see, that's his redeeming quality, the right path he purposed for our lives. You know, in Acts chapter 16 last Sunday, we looked at very passionately, or at least I got a little passionately carried away, at the mishap of Paul, and I heard that giggle, and started in verse 25, as you look there, morning, if you would, turn with me to Acts 16. Again this morning, Acts 16, verse 25. 
and we're going to read how Paul and Silas had been beaten and bound in the bottom of the prison. We covered this last week. They had been placed for intruding on the economics of a certain individual who were using a possessed woman as a fortune teller. Do you remember that part? That's an interesting, that actually goes back up prior to verse 25. When Paul cast out her demon, he and Silas were not praised for their efforts to save this woman's soul. And I put that in there because in that kind of way it feels today. You see, all this that we're doing this morning, all this worship to Father God, salvation, the world really sees that as what? Waste of time, right? Now, if we were to gather up all of our money and make a donation to some fund, guess what? Oh, those people, like at the Pines Baptist Church, they're just wonderful people. Yeah. See, that's what happened. See, Paul was concerned about the woman's soul when he lifted the spirit from her soul through the power of Jesus Christ, but rather being praised for their efforts to save this woman's life, her true life. They were placed in prison for their efforts, impacted the owner of the slave's woman for making money. He impeded their economic progress, right? They said, oh, my goodness. He took away how we were using her to make a living. Therefore, we ought to put them in prison. It's a beautiful story if you go on to read it. And later they found out as politicians they were Jews. And guess what? Oh, well, we can't put them in jail because they're Jews. So they just said, we forgive you, right? Just don't do it no more. Don't you love that? That goes a long way, doesn't it, Diddy, with raising children? <laughs> just don't do it no more. <laughs> no, every now and then you just got to whack them, right? That's what God has to do with us every now and then. He has to whack us. Now, regardless of the reason, we learn in verse 25, we find that even in their hopeless state, Paul and Silas found themselves. This bitter, beautiful, uh, horrible spot being in the bottom of the, of, the, of, of, of the prison, we find in their faith their purpose in God was not diminished. And that's what we're talking about this morning. Worshiping even when it's bad, right? I mean, by our nature, it's so tempting to just call up and say, well, it's horrible, right? This is broke, that's broke, I don't have that, I don't have this, I don't, no, no. But every now and then, just to stop and say, oh, Father God, thank you for what I do have. How about thank you for how long I've been here? Right. right? I've made it 60 years. And for the most part, it's got a few, uh, few broken bones and a few uh, self-inflicted gunshot wounds. I'm still alive, right? Anybody else have any self-inflicted gunshot wounds that they'd rather not discuss? Mm-hmm. You'd like to blame someone else. I know I do. I was trying to blame Justin and everybody else for my problems, my wife, my, my kids. But guess what? One day I had to own up to Jesus Christ and salvation and say, whoo, this is who I am. I made these decisions that put me here at 50 years old, and now I want out of the pit that I put me here. And Father God said what? Get up, son, and walk off. I've already covered you. Huh? Mm-hmm. Leave it. But I always tell you, leave it. Leave it. Don't, don't, don't drag along with you. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. And that's what we find. In fact, we find this in work. They were worshiping God. Look at Acts 25. And we just read this, but again, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, thinking, whoo, these are some fruit loops right here. You ain't getting out of here. You locked up, bound up, chained up. You ain't never getting out of here. What are, what are you singing about? But yet Paul and Silas were singing, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. They say, don't you see that you're bound? Rats are nipping on your toes. You are not getting out of the bottom of this prison. And Paul said, oh, how I love Jesus. Now look, 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 look. Look in verse 26. When suddenly, suddenly, and this is where the power of God got loose, right? Suddenly when the power of God got loose and there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and Paul and Silas and everybody involved in the whole chain up were released, Right? Why? Because they were complaining about where they were? No, because they were praising their God for giving them the opportunity to witness him no matter where they were or what condition they were. Aren't we a bunch of little salty Americans these days, aren't we? Yes, sir. Ooh, the air conditioner's not on. I can't go to church Sunday. Oh, come on. Oh, it rained last night. I can't go to church. Oh, it's so pretty this morning. I just need a day off, right? And it ain't about going to church, but it is about worshiping your God, Amen. right? And I don't know how many, anyway, I don't know, I start to say something negative. I'm not, I'm just going to move on. See, the power of God loosen and freedom. Don't you understand this is the same story that we have in our lives, right? We come bound and shackled in our own world, on our own lives, pinned and prisoned by what we think, what we've done to ourselves. And Father God says, praise me and I will lift you from that freedom. Huh? Amen. Right? I will shake some ground if I need to. If you'll bring it to me. But if you're going to carry it around and whine and cry and just and, and keep trying to fix it, he said, praise me and give it to me and let me let me move some chains for you, right? Let me let me let me shake a few prisons for you, huh? And here's the deal. How many have actually ever tried it? Hmm? That's where a lot of the world lives with this, right? I don't believe in that God stuff. Ever tried it? No. 
But I, I went once. I didn't like it at all. It made me feel uncomfortable. It ought to be. You know why? Because you came into the light of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right? You ought to feel uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. If you've been dirty, I'm talking about spiritually, right? Right? If you come into the light of the Lord, Lord, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you're missing something, and I have it for you, right? I have it for you. I want you to have that conviction. It's not a condemnation. It's a conviction of heart to say, hey, you are headed to Longview, but you're headed to Dangerfield. Are you reading the signs, and are you going to turn around? That's the beautiful part about it. Now, in case you haven't picked up on this fact, Toyd, as I just said, the reason that Paul and Silas were freed was because of them praising God in the condition they found themselves, right? Woo, Didi needs that praising about two or three, four times a day. <laughs> She's like, praise Jesus. I'm going to kill somebody. I know it's going to happen for the day's over. Give me strength, God. Give me strength. Give me strength. Have you ever been in this position in your life? Right? Have you ever been in that position when, when all the options seem to be bad ones? That you can't think of. You can't, you can't, you've got an illness. You've got job issues. You've got family uh, needs. You've got personal affliction. Or maybe at some times, have you had all of them at one time? Because oftentimes they come in pairs when Satan is out to devour, Right? Right? And that's what I mean, as we talked about last week, that's what you have to see is that Satan is trying to destroy you in any way he can. If nothing else, he wants to pull you off your path. I'm just telling you. You've got to understand who the witness is. But see, here's what Paul he wanted us to know. Instead of allowing the chains that Satan would bind you with as to live in loss, regret, confusion, or uncertainty, or depression, right? Don't live in those conditions. I was driving in this morning. We have had not had the best of week at our house. And I was driving around the corner, and I was listening to some Casting Crown, and I was thinking, and then I stopped, and I thought, you know what? Satan, get out. Amen. Have you ever just, you know, just, I've had enough this week, right? Yes. And your negativity and the constant issues, and yes, I don't have an answer for everything that's going on, but I have a God that does. I Amen. walk out of this, right? Amen. Get out of my car. Get out of my house. Get out of my life. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever should believe in him should have faith and will not die but live and God did not send the son into the world to die to, to condemn but to save my soul my miserable soul Satan get your butt out of my truck get it out of my life get it away from my wife get it away from my church get it away from my friends get out Amen. And let me tell you, if every one of us would pray this all day long, this church would get a whole lot spiritually more power. Amen. I'm just telling you. We battled with Satan this morning. I watched him try to mess up this young girl's life this week. Right? That was a part of Satan's activity, right? Can I just knock her? Look how hard she's working. Look how hard she's trying. Can I just knock her off her game? If I can knock her off her game, then guess what? Guess what? Then I can turn her. I can move her. I can say, where's your God now, right? Huh? And that's how he works on every one of you. He wants you to believe that it's something. Oh, oh, well, Kay said something to me that was ugly. Right at that moment, Kay might have had the devil in her. I'm just telling you. <laughs> She's smiling at me at this point. Right? But see, sometimes Satan comes in that form, right? He comes through other people, and he comes through other events, and he comes through other issues to bound us and shackle us, and we forget to reach up and praise the holy Jesus, lift me back up out of this. Amen. Right? It's a song. Did you hear the song? And we talked about it last Sunday. Satan is a defeated spirit. I don't want to get to heaven and face God and him say, why didn't you do anything with your Christian talents? Uh, because I just was constantly depressed and upset and, and I didn't really totally believe. He said, well, don't, don't you know, I'd already, I already took Satan out. Satan can only be as strong as you allow him to be. Listen to me, that you allow him to be in your life. If you want to follow him around and nurse on that, get you some of it because he'll let you have all that you want. But if you want the freedom of God by the word of God this morning, you need to understand the freedom that's available to you when you praise Jesus in the highest events, right? Amen. When you praise and you ask, right? That's what I'm talking about this morning. To stand up, to, to stop being moaning. Poor, poor, pitiful me in prayer. Oh, Father God, you just don't know how bad it is. Oh, guess what? His family, his people, his community hung him on a cross with nails. I think he covered it. I think he understands what pain is. I think he understands what physical and emotional and stress is to know that the people that he came to love said, we'd rather kill you than be around you. That is having an awkward personality. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. That's that place in school where we don't fit in and in, in our jobs where we just feel a little bit odd. You should feel a little bit odd if you're going to be a Christian. You know why? You don't fit in. Because what they talk about, what they think about, and what they want should not be the same things that you do. So you should be one of those people that say, this doesn't work for me. This doesn't feel good. This, this is just not well. No, it's not. You know why? You're not of them. 
You're not of this world. You are a child of holy Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? Supplied by God, saved by Christ, and supported by the Holy Spirit. And I'm already out of time. I just got started. <laughs> yeah. I got to land this thing in, I don't know, in, when the wheels come down. Right? <laughs> See, he tells us pointly, God tells us pointly, that when his people call his name Elijah praying from sky. You remember that? Mm -hmm. What happened when Elijah prayed from the sky? Fire yes. came down, <laughs> whoosh, yes. left a hole, and went back up. Right? You got that kind of faith? Well, that doesn't really happen, Brother Tim. That's just in the Old Testament. How would we know? Because I don't think we have that kind of faith to believe that God would actually send fire down if we prayed for it. Huh? That's the kind of faith I'm talking about this morning in a God that we know, right? He will, he will hear the prayer and he will answer him. How do we know that? Because it's in his word of God. And in his word of God is the truth of the Father God, right? right? I hope you're with me this morning. The question, therefore, is not the power of God, but the faith of the one who asks. And when our God moves, things happen. Lives are free and changes are bound. As we continue to read in verse 27, look, and the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors opening, so suppose, uh, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to commit suicide, about to kill himself. But Paul called out in a loud voice and said, do not harm yourself. We're all here. We're all here because we still have a purpose here. We're not done yet. Why? I just don't know why God won't take me home. Because he's not done with you yet. Wake up and open your eyes. He has a purpose for your life. And if you could, well, selfishly, if he'd just take me out here, it'd be a lot better. Yes, it would be. It would be. And for some of us, it would be better for all of us. <laughs> did he just say that? He did. We need you to get happy about who you are in Christ. Amen. Right? <laughs> oh, it is horrible. It is. This world is horrible. Why? Because Satan is involved in it. Yes. Pray God to, to, to not take me home, but to be the witness that in the time of troubles, we can stand up and praise Jesus, and people will say, why are they singing about Jesus? I don't know. Well, let's go ask them. That's what they did right here. That's what they did right here. And this is where we stopped last week as we discussed the faith that these two men showed in God, as well as to denote a very key fact to the possession of the woman. And backing up just for a moment, you do remember, I wanted to stress it to you, what Paul relieved from her was the spirit that had possessed her, right? Again, the only reason I bring that back is I can't stress it enough. God does not wish to condemn the person. He wants to remove and change in redemption the spirit that dwells within, right? That's the influence of the negativity. Is like I said this morning, Satan, get out. Get out of me. That's what Paul said. Get out of her and go on about your business. And the Satan said, because he's a defeated spirit, and through Jesus Christ, he got out, right? Through the power of Christ. See, the woman is redeemed from the spirit of Satan and freedom, right? Paul and Silas, already Christians, were redeemed for their physical bondage to this world. And the gender, as we're about to read, is redeemed into Christ by the, his witness, again, is given him freedom. In all three of these examples, in this very short passage, the woman, Paul and Silas, and the jailer, guess what has the example? It all ends in one thing. Freedom, right? Three different conditions, three different issues, all in the redeeming power of God, end up in freedom because they have the faith to believe. Amen? Amen? How do I walk in a world that I know is constantly, and my body's wearing out, and my mind is wore out, and everything is ugly? That's not, well, not everything. There's some good stuff in this world, right? Not everything. But there's a lot of it that's just ugly, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How do I deal with all this? Through the love of Jesus Christ, right? Amen. Through the love of Jesus Christ. See, they, these are three different examples, but they all went to the same place. That's the, that's the opportunity of salvation, the, the opportunity of a redeemed person, our to be changed, to be redeemed into the family of God, to be set free. This is why even as Christians uh, uh, in our lives, God asks these questions. Why are you hiding? Hmm? Why are you running? Where are you doubting? Why are you denying me? And overall, where are you? Why don't you believe me this morning? Why don't you trust me? Why don't you praise me instead of doubting me? Father God, I just don't think I can do this. Father God, you can. I can't. That's how that, 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 how that prayer goes right there. Man, I can't do this, but I know you can, Father God. Let me ask you this. If you haven't tried it, then how's your life plan going? Huh? How's your life plan going? Wow, I've got so much here, and I'm not even going to get close to it. But I've got to take you down since the sermon title is one degree off. I guess I should discuss that part of one degree, right? Because what is the significance of one degree? And in one degree, as a builder, it, it, that's a tiny little amount, isn't it? You both boys are both builders, right? Right? A sixteenth of an inch. Anybody know what a sixteenth of an inch is? Hmm? Sure, surely being one degree off would not make much difference, or does it? Stretch of 20 huh? foot. What? Stretch of 20 foot. 
stretch it 20 foot. Well, consider with me the very physical fact about mathematics and measurement. This ought to blaze you over in the last few minutes of this sermon. I'm just saying. How tiny one degree of change in a direction can impact our lives, especially to where we think we're headed. And realize, one degree seems like such an insignificant amount, right? One tiny degree, for it's true, one degree from center is not a tremendous difference if you're just standing still. If I'm just standing here and I'm just one degree off, guess what? I'm pretty much still where I'm still standing. I wonder if I could have three volunteers right quick from the, from the audience. Okay, come on. Uh, come on, Tammy. Got three, sweetie. Thank you, though. If y'all could just... If Grace, if you could just stand right here, just just look straight straight ahead, right there. Thank you. And, and and young man, I forget your name. What's your name? Jose. Jose. If you could stand just just as close to her as you can, right, just perfectly, then come over here, young man. Such a good-looking young man. There you go. If you could stand right there. Now, I brought my ruler. Uh -oh. Slap him. <laughs> Slap him. No, no. no, 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 no they get out of the grease. What I want you to do. What I want you to do. I'm gonna put it right here to center her toes, and I want you to toe, turn your shoes. That way, just that much. No, not too much. Just a little bit. Just one more. Oh, right there. Okay. And Jose, I want you to turn your shoes the same way. Just a little more. A little more. A little. Oh, okay. Right there. Right there. Right there. One more. All right. Now, now, I want y'all to start walking in the direction that your feet are pointing. Keep going. You two. You're, she's running to the pulpit. You two keep going. Keep going, Jose. Keep going. Keep going. All right. All right, that's good. That's good. Now, where were y'all? Right there. And how close were y'all to each other? Shoulder, oh, shoulder. you see what a quarter of an inch can do, what one degree off can do. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate the example. Do you understand? Huh? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank y'all. Very, 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 very. See, let me explain. A degree is the unit as represented a measurement of an angle, right? We talk about 360 degrees in a circle, right? 180 degrees, 90 degrees, 40 degrees. But, you know, I don't have time to go through all this. I wish I did. Spent so much time, but we're going to run out of time. But I just want you to understand how important the word degree is in our language, right? We use it in music, mathematics. We discuss it as honorary degrees, right? Scholarship degree. Oh, she got a degree. He's a bachelor's degree, right? We, we talk about people's temperament with it. Oh, she was somewhat a degree hot, right? Right? We, we, we use it in so many different ways, and I just consumed a whole bunch in, to, to a little bit to get through this. But you understand the concept that everything that we have, but what about, when, as he said, what about to be one degree off after one foot? After one foot, you're .2 inches off. That doesn't seem like very much either, does it? Point two. That seems small, right? Right? If somebody came up and said, I give you, I give you .2 of a dollar, you would be like, really? I'd rather have the whole dollar, right? Yeah. Let's suppose if they came up and said, I'll give you $20. That would be a whole lot more impressive, right? Right? But see, mathematically speaking, to be one degree off, after one foot, you would be about 0.2 inches. So consider with me, if I walk to the back of the building and, and it's 60 foot back there, that's about 35 steps. But if I step off just one degree, I'll be two foot off my mark when I finally arrive there, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what Justin was talking about. Mm -hmm. See, to be one degree off. Therefore, let me ask you, how many steps have you taken today, and are you on the right direction? Hmm? Let me ask you again, how many since Monday? How many steps have you taken since Monday? How many since you were born? And more importantly, how many since you were born again? Huh? You see, could there be by chance starting out just one degree off? Maybe you've wandered off a little too far from where your God is, right? Have you considered how our choice of direction impacts our lives if we're just one degree off from God as for us to realize the importance of our path is not to where we started, but where we will end up? You see, Father God's never worried about where you started, just like the story of this jailer this morning. He had beaten and chained Paul as in orders to put them in prison, right? And just here this short time after, he's doing what? Well, look right quickly. Well, where was he? Well, let me flip over to verse 29. Excuse me, verse 27. He said, uh, and, and the keeper in the prison awakening and, 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 and from sleep and seeing the prisoner door open supporting the prison uh, prisoners had fled drew his sword and was about to kill himself but Paul called him a loud voice and said do yourself no harm for we are all here now look what's the very next part if you don't have this next part highlight the one two three four five six for highlights you should highlight that verse 29 what does it say huh anybody he called for what a light a cigarette light he was having a stressful moment, right? <laughs> Anybody got light? Ooh, I can't explain this to my boss, right? No, what light is he talking about? Come on. He called for what? He called for a light. Right? Oh, that was the light we're thinking about, right? It was a light because he was asking for a physical light, but what did he get? 
He was calling for the light of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. See, that's that beautiful part. He might have been a hundred miles off. He might have been the jailer. He might have been the one that was persecuting Paul and Cyrus. But right in that moment, right in verse 29, he said, and he called for the light. And yes, I know I'm taking it out of context, but think about the power in that statement when we call for the light. Yeah. Man, that's when, when, when the man called for the light is when he realized how far off course. One degree might have been a thousand degrees, but guess what? Christ did not care how far he was off. He wanted to know where he was going. And that's when he got back on track with God that night when he called for light. And he ran, and it says in verse 29 or 30, it says, and he ran, and he fell down trembling for Paul and Silas because guess what? Think about it. If you were in some place with somebody, and all of a sudden the world, if this begin, begin, building began to shake and tremble, right? Huh? And the top came off, right? And the power of God was present, and those bound within were lifted to heaven. Wouldn't you have a couple of questions? I think I might be trembling too, right? I might be trembling too. And he says he called for the light and he ran and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas and asked, what must I do to be saved? And another word for that is, what must I do to be redeemed? What, what, how do I get this thing? How do I get this? How do I get set back on the right path? And in verse 31 it says what? Anybody? What's the word? Believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your household. That's a promise that we need in some households. Again, we need some parents to get right in God, get back on track with God, and know that God will save that family. Amen. Right? Why? Again, truth to God. That he will lift them up. I ask you this morning by a show of hands, how many of you ever gotten lost? Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, quite a few. And in being lost is when we realize we cannot find our own way. We can't get back. Recalling that when God asks us a question, it's not because he does not know the answer. It, he asks it to reassure ourselves that in him that you know where you're still heading. Are you on the right path this morning? Are you planning Longview but looking at Dangerfield? Right? Let me share this with you this morning. This is those first words y'all like to hear in closing. In 1979, 257 people left New Zealand before a sightseeing flight to Antarctica. Unknown to the pilots, there was a two-degree error in the flight coordinates. Most people hearing that would think what? Close enough, right? Close enough. I've done some work with Don lately. It just irritates him when I say that. Close enough. It just Don just. Oh. That'd be good. I just love it, man. I mean, I just get him all fired up. Oh, it's close enough. Oh. And then I'm like, I'm just messing with you. We'll fix it, right? He's still fretting over the peers out. I mean, the Joyce out here in the bathroom right now, just killing him, right? It's an inch and a half off, and it's driving Don crazy. But it's just an inch and a half off, right? Gotta go. Gotta go. Sorry. Two degree area in flat. Most people hearing that word, Don's not here, by the way, so I can talk about it. Most people hearing that would think that that's close enough. But that two degree error, in fact, placed the aircraft 28 miles to the east of where the plane was routed to go. 28 miles off course with a two degree arrow when they started. The error in two degrees placed them directly in the path of Mount Everest, an active volcano that rises from the frozen landscape to the height of more than 12,000 feet. And sadly, the plane crashed in the side of that volcano, killing everyone on board in 1979. True story. Wow. You know, it's hard to imagine how this tragedy was brought about by a minor error, a matter of only being a couple of degrees off, folks. See, the reality of God's grace is not to condemn where we have been, but to inspire where we can go. That's the beautiful redemption power of God. He never asks where you've been. He's always asking where you want to go. His whole purpose in life, his whole function as, as God to us and through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is to help us safely arrive our destination home. And we use heaven as some, mm, I don't know, some adjective or some place that, oh, when we get to heaven, that's what you should start calling when I get home. Because, see, if I've accepted Christ, then I am an heir to the child of, of God, an heir to the kingdom, and I'm going home to heaven. It's not some, you know, some scientific, it's, it's real. It's where I'm going home to, home to be with my Father. See, he encourages us to become more than what we think we are, but, to, but by being what he knows us designed to be. But you have to step out of the way and let him have controls of this so that you can know who you are. I mean, we, many of us have lived short in our lives because we only see our capability. 
And I, as I started the sermon with Danny, I can give you a thousand reasons why we shouldn't be here this morning. But I can give you one for why we are. Amen. All week long, I beat myself up. Trust me, Barbara, I, I quit every 37 seconds all week long. Because I can give you a thousand reasons and a thousand excuses why I shouldn't go back and why we shouldn't and why we shouldn't keep trying. But there's only one that keeps saying every Sunday morning, yes, you can because I am. Amen. Right? Yes. I am. See, in order to do so, we have to decide if we're really living for Christ or if we what you think we're close enough. Because if you're living close enough, and I keep sharing this, and I love this analogy, on the ark, close enough will get you drowned. See, there's either in the ark or not in the ark. When the door shuts, you'll either be in the ark or you'll be out of the ark. And I'm not trying to scare you or threaten you, but I want you to think about one degree off, you're just hitting your nose on the bottom of the ship. Right? Are you in this morning? We can all be impacted by just being one degree off. I ask you, perhaps somewhat threatened this week by a few, excuse me, so I want you to think about the fact of the matter is, are, how far off plumb are you? That's a fun joke, isn't it? Because all of us are off, right? That's the beautiful part we need to be more true, honest to our children about. Yes, your parents are whacked, right? Your pastor, right? We're just little versions of you, right? But what we hope and what we pray for is that God directs us in the correct path. Yes. And that in that we see where we are for a reason. And even when we think this is a horrible place to be, this position in my life right now is very uncomfortable to me, that we can stand and raise our voices and say, I praise God. Because where I'm at, and where one of these beautiful young children are, and where someone 20 years older than me are, guess what? It all changed to some degree, but then again it doesn't. Because there's only one, one, one way home to Father God. And that's through Jesus Christ. Amen. See, one degree can be devastating, but in God, all is made well. Amen? Amen. Amen. And would you stand this morning as we sing? God bless you. The altars are open if you need them. If you'd like to join with us, please do so. If you'd like to talk about Christ's love too, if you'd just love to come down and pray for our country or your family or anything else, altars are open. Amen. Brother John? 325. Page 325 this morning.